Um, first, I just want to say thank you to Minha um, for coming to Los Angeles. She's actually here for the Los and no the yes Los Angeles Asian Pacific Film Festival, where she's screening her new film tomorrow. Um, so you should no not tomorrow Saturday the 23rd. Tomorrow there's a whole full day of programming here that you should all come to. Um, so. It's a huge honor um, to have Minha here, and I'm so happy that she's here, and this is such a lovely um, group of people, and I appreciate all of you coming. Um, there's something, I've been thinking about this as I'm like very scared and don't like to talk in public, but there's something um, really like literally moving about what happens when we get together um, to attune to one another, to attend one another. Um, so thank you for your presence tonight. Um, I'm going to do the thing where I read um, bios and tell you a little bit about all of the amazing things that um, Trinity Minha has done and written and made. Um, but I wanted to begin first actually with her voice from a uh, woman native other from the beginning of that text, um, just to give you a sense of what that sounds like. Okay. The story began long ago. This is the world in which I move, uninvited, profane on a sacred land, neither me nor mine, but me nonetheless. The story began long ago. It is old. Older than my body, my mother's, my grandmother's, as old as me, old, spontaneous me, the world. For years, we have been passing it on so that our daughters and granddaughters may continue to pass it on, so that it may become larger than its proper measure, always larger than its own insignificance. The story never really begins nor ends, even though there is a beginning and an end to every story, just as there is a beginning and an end to every teller. One can date it back to the immemorial days when a group of mighty men attributed to itself a central, dominating position vis-a-vis -vis other groups, overvalued its particularities and achievements, adopted a projective attitude toward those it classified among the out-groups, and wrapped itself up in its own thinking, interpreting the out-group through the in-group mode of reasoning while claiming to speak the minds of both the in-group and the out-group. So that's the beginning of Woman Native Other, the very beginning. Fierce. OK. So Trinti Minha is a filmmaker and a writer, a composer, a questioner, a listener, a thinker, a maker in words and images and sounds. She teaches at the University of California, Berkeley, in both the departments of gender and women's studies and of rhetoric. I think it's fair to say that for someone who values so much stillness, quiet, slowness, she is unfathomably prolific. Her books include a forthcoming volume entitled Love Seidel, Walking with the Disappeared, which comes out actually hopefully next month um, through Fordham University Press, Deep Passage, The Digital Way, Elsewhere Within Here, The Digital Film Event, Cinema Interval, Framer Framed, When the Moon Waxes Red, and Woman Native Other. She is the maker of eight feature-length films, including Forgetting Vietnam, which is this film that we'll be screening on Saturday at the Los Angeles Asian Pacific Film Festival. She also has made Night Passage, The Fourth Dimension, and A Tale of Love, and Surname Viet, given name Nam. Her work also includes several large-scale collaborative installations, including Old Land, New Waters, that showed at the third Guangzhou Triennial in China, L'Autre March at the Musée du Quai Branly in Paris, The Desert is Watching at the Kyoto Biennial, and Nothing But Ways at the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts. She has received numerous awards, including the Wild Dreamer Lifetime Achievement Award at the Subversive Festival in Zagreb, Croatia, the Lifetime Achievement from the Women's Caucus for Art, the Critics' Choice Book Award of the American Educational Studies Association for Elsewhere Within Here, Trailblazers Award at the Cannes International Documentary Film Festival. In a world that so often tells us that we cannot do a thing, that we cannot speak, write, love, think, 
listen, care for, or learn in the ways in which our bodies, minds, spirits, sights might incline us. There are certain thinkers, waymakers, poets, spirit wanderers, walkers, who teach by example that there may be other answers, there may be other questions, there may be other possibilities, other ways of being, other ways of knowing, loving, learning, other ways we might survive. Trinti Minha is one such teacher, the kind of teacher that shows a way is possible, the kind that through an embrace of darkness, the night, unknowing, unlearning, quiet, the unwritten and unwriting, manages to illuminate a path. Her work shows us that critique is not attack, but is instead a movement interwritten with care, care for the other, care for the other in ourselves, care for ourselves, care to constantly question what ourselves even means, to never imagine that the story might be a finished one. Her movement is one of attunement, an ability to move and continue to be moved, to admit that to be is to always already be moved by the other, to be moved by one another, to constantly play at this, to never allow the pieces to settle totally. I think often of the strangeness of first finding this teacher in the trenches of the university, a place where I am still unlearning the narratives that will tell someone like me, someone who is other, that I cannot, that I am not, that my voice is somehow not. Encountering Minha in this space, coming near to her thinking, to her gift, made possible and continues to make possible breath in a space which too often is airtight. One afternoon in what must have been an, an afternoon 10 years ago or more, I was struggling with the weight of having to write a dissertation. Now beginning to see the intricacies of what exactly this weight was of its many entangled historical threads. I found myself already three years later than what I should have been, um, than actually what is so violently called normative time, um, in Minha's quiet office with the lights off, afternoon sun paling outside. In the quiet of that space, she asked me, but Latia, why are you writing this? As many graduate students have been trained to do, I began to perform isms and jargon spilling from my mouth. No, no, she said. She stopped me. Go away and ask yourself, why am I writing this? What is the story here that has not been told? This may take some months, she told me, and you do not need to write the answer, but you need to write from that place. And if you cannot find the answer, you need to write of something else. I'm still growing in to all that Minha teaches, and I am so honored that her teaching brings her here tonight. So, thank you. Um. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, yeah, for this uh, beautiful and very moving introduction. Actually, at this time in Berkeley, with everything that happens in the academic world, where you are so dispirited <laughs> with the whole process, to hear this is, gives me a lot of energy. And so thank you very much. Um, it is really a privilege you know, for me to be part of this symposium, focus on just speaking nearby. And of course, I would like to thank Litya for this wonderful opportunity to share my work. Tonight's film is actually an early film of mine, Reassemblage. It was made when I was living and teaching in Senegal, and also giving you know, lessons at the Dakar Conservatory of Music while doing research you know, in ethnomusicology. And so 
it was a very odd position, you know, to be in, to come to a cultural context with which you share a post-colonial background, but also to be able to show something from a culture or a people that you love. The question that immediately arise, of course, is how? How can one show something without packaging knowledge, without simply enclosing the culture in half an hour, in one hour, for example? So it was with all these questions, you know, that I came up with uh, reassemblage. And certainly tonight's lecture, I would um, give you a range of speaking nearby. So um, please enjoy the film, and then afterwards we can certainly um, discuss further. Thank you. After having heard Litia read the opening page of Woman Native Other, you know, I'm almost tempted to ask her to <laughs> read the lecture for me. <laughs> So beautifully, she embodied the voice, you know, of that text. In working at opening a creative space, you know, for the politics of speaking nearby, I have repeatedly returned to the questioning praxis of intervals, third terms, in-betweens, two-hold, twilight, and middle grays, outside in or inside out movements and with this the traveling self the stranger in a strange land the migrant at home the wanderer across language the many with one rather than the official many in one of master narratives and also the inappropriated inappropriate other. In the politics of representation, the praxis of speaking nearby, as initialized in my film Reassemblage that you have just seen, but but realize in all of my work, such a praxis is a way of speaking with and speaking in proximity, whether the other is present or absent during the speech act. The praxis often puts the speaker on precarious ground, making it impossible for her to function in an unquestioned position of authority hence allowing her to avoid the trap of merely speaking about, for, or on behalf of, as well as of claiming to give voice to the repressed and underprivileged. The challenge of speaking nearby takes on a new lease of life with each work created. Nearness as manifestation of the infinity as a way of letting things come to oneself in all liveliness, a way of maintaining relations of infinity, a way of listening to intervals, a way of manifesting the between. So at the same time as you have something like the gap between, you also have a proximity that keeps the possibilities open, that keeps the interval alive. This is, for example, what a number of feminist theorists and poets 
refer to when they were working with a sense of touch as differentiated from sight. The hand or the word that goes toward things with delicateness, without grabbing, capturing, or enclosing. And some of the relations you know, that I would be touching on here, because there are many of them that we can discuss or bring in, but I can only touch on some of them here. And for example, it would be the relation between the verbal and visual, between words and image, not only within the film, but also between live reality, camera and screen, or between film subject, filmmaker, and film viewer. The relation between musical, the musical, the visual, and the verbal, or between ear, eye, and hand, how to show, how to tell, how to write, with what voice, how to approach a work, who's speaking, and hence who's listening. Each work presents a new challenge. And I have a number of examples that I have done in the past, such as in the book Elsewhere Within Here, there is you know, um, there is a piece that is a chapter that is called Far Away, Comma, From Home. And I still remember when I first wrote that piece, the uh, publisher in Germany um, published it, but took out the comma. So rather than far away, comma, from home, the publisher published far away from home. So you can immediately see the transformation. So I was not interested in being far away from home, but I was very interested in being far away and from home, you know, the two hold. And so when I publish it again, you know, in Elsewhere Within Here, I have to put another title underneath in parenthesis, the comma between. <laughs> and then there is also a form of indirectness when you decide, for example, to uh, speak nearby. Very often, you are actually working with a form of indirectness, even though the direct form is also very useful sometimes you know, to anchor that indirectness. But here is an example that um, came out as I was very inspired by the work of um, Birago Diop, you know, the African writer Birago Diop. So this piece is called Mother's Talk the most stupid of all animals that fly, walk, and swim, that live beneath the ground in water or in the air, are undoubtedly crocodiles, which crawl on land and walk at the bottom of the water. And this for no other reason than that they have the best memories in the world." Close quote. So this is how Senegalese poet and storyteller, Birago Diop, begins the tale of Mother Crocodile. This is how he recounts the narrative of his elders, which he ascribed to another teller, the griot, or storyteller, singer, and genealogist, Amadou Kumba. And to complicate matters further, this is also what Amadou Kumba said he remembered from another teller yet, for that is not my opinion, said Amadou Kumba. That is what Golo the monkey says. 
And although everyone agrees that Golo is the most coarsely spoken of all the creatures, since he is their griot, he sometimes manages to make the most sensible remarks, so some say, or at least to make us believe he has made them according to others, close quote. So talking here brought the, brought three male identified voices together while deferring their unity. The story presents itself as a piece of gossip that circulates from teller to teller. The man who narrates, yup, implicitly warns the reader that he is quoting Amadou Kumba, who actually got it from Golo the monkey. Right at the outset, the question is raised as to the real source of such a gossip. If the reader can't really tell whether Golo makes sensible remarks or whether he simply takes the lead in making people believe that he is the one to have made them, then whose opinion is it exactly? As the tale progresses, storytelling becomes increasingly reflexive and the reader is further led to ask, who among the tellers is the real monkey? So um, this is, you know, for me also another way of maintaining that relation of infinity in telling. And there is also, I think that this microphone, it keeps on going down and down. <laughs> I can just take it out. Yeah, that would be fine. Yeah. So the um, one more piece, you know, that from elsewhere within here, that I would like to just read, you know, like a, a paragraph for you, and it's a piece that is called White Spring, and it was written in relation to Teresa Hakyungja's uh, work. As some of you know, she is a performer, is a performance artist. She is also a filmmaker, a video maker. And she writes a public book. And one of her most well-known book is called Dicte. So when I, when I encounter Cha's work, um, it was a very moving encounter. It is as if, you know, we were exactly on the same way, wavelength. And so it's very difficult, you know, when you encounter that kind of work to speak about it. When I was approached to write something about her work, I um, immediately noticed how others speak about her work which is you know, to go to biographical details, for example, or to everything that she wrote about the work. And in a way, you know, by bringing up or setting a frame for this work, um, it does exactly what speaking about usually does, which is simply frame it. So in questioning that kind of um, writing, which is very difficult to escape. I came up with this. Teresa Cha, you know, actually said that she wants to be the dream of the audience. It's a dream, one says, waking up in silence. And now, one wonders whether one has just dreamt a silence, or whether the silence is the sound of a dream. The entire room brims with incandescent silence. One sees not a thing with one's eyes open, and one perks one's ears up. No, not even the faint echo of an eye. And yet, somewhere nearby, something is silently beaming in recognition. 
try to frame that beam into visibility and it will quickly fade out from you. Try to touch it, even with the darker hand and soon the lighter hand, yearning for proof, will reach out in earnest, depriving it of its freedom to disappear, protective and well-meaning. Perhaps the hand merely forgets to draw back in time for the radiance to flare up on its own. In the passage from light to light container or from dream to dream reading, always lurking is the risk of emptying out the very space of dream and further of preventing dreamlands from rising out of sleeping bodies. And here is also um, the opening of cinema interval, since I was really working with the notion of interval in cinema, but also that relation between text you know, and image. The relation of word to image is an infinite relation. What is released on the film screen is neither given up to sight nor put safely under the shroud of invisibility. An image is powerful, not necessarily because of anything specific it offers the viewer, but because of everything it apparently also takes away from the viewer. Nothing and everything, including specifically the ability to put into words what the body feels, to articulate or to name once and for all reaffirming the relation of word to image in its infinity is not merely to say that verbal language cannot capture with accuracy what lies on the other side of the discursive border, or that its function proves to be inadequate when the realm of activity involved is, for example, that of looking and hearing rather than of speaking and deciphering. But if seeing and sounding isn't saying, it's likely because words work best in relationships when they are taken to the very threshold of language, at once bound to and freed from external reference. Words as words cannot speak for or be subordinated to the image. They can, however, deploy their own logic to indicate the direction, to bring into relief a landscape through which a film moves, and when treated as a sound world of their own, they render audible and readable the multiplicity of the interpretive process itself. So actually, you know, what you have here would be um, a lecture that can be viewed as an example of speaking nearby my own work, you know, since it's not always possible to respond to a lot of expectation of speaking about your own film. You know, what one can come up with is, for example, Nothing is more conventional than an approach to politics that is aimed at the most obvious location of power, the head of state and other personalities of the body politic. But for me, politics permeates our everyday. It is the dimension of one's consciousness in being. The distinction offered between making a political film or writing and making films politically helps to widen the scope of the political, freeing it from the domain of economics and of body politics. The implied refocus on the caliber of consciousness in the making process, or on form as inseparable from content, serves as a reminder of how works featuring progressive actions can ultimately prove to be regressive in their unquestioned replication of structural relations of power. As the feminist struggle 
used to voice the personal is political. Not because everything personal is naturally political, but because everything can be politicized down to the smallest details of our daily activities. I am reminded here of the Palestinian poet, Mahmoud Dawish, whose first reaction when coming out from a blast that destroyed his house and his home was to affirm his need for coffee and hence for writing. Rather than dwelling on the loss, he affirms life through his yearning for coffee and for writing. And rather than railing against the oppression of his people through violent and bloody events that have become part of their struggle, he wrote beautifully on bread and water, the two basic elements of life largely denied to his people. While other writers were busy defining the role of the poet and accusing him of lagging behind his responsibilities, Dawish reminded them that nowhere in his Beirut or in his writing could he find such a thing as, quote and unquote, a poet. For him, there is no Beirut in Beirut. Power relations lie at the core of normative representations. The politics of form can neither be reduced to the series of ism that mark social and artistic movements, nor equated with question of genre, style, and composition or representation. Form in its radical sense should address the formless as it is as it ultimately refers to the processes of life and death. Affirming form is recognizing the important contribution of each vibrant life as a continual creative process. All the while, letting form go is acknowledging our own mortality or the necessity to work with the limits of every instance of form. 